So uh, our first presenter today is Derek Chu from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. He is a concert pianist, music educator, music consultant, and a wonderful colleague and friend of mine. His presentation is on professional development. Derek, it's all you. Thanks, Heather. Hi, everyone. Good morning. It's nice to see you all and, and meet you all. It's the first time I've um, attended. I'm usually teaching at this time. And when Heather invited me, I said, OK, I'm going to block off um, Thursday morning on January 7th so I can uh, meet some wonderful and inspiring teachers and also share uh, a little bit about what is so important to me, which is uh, professional development. So just bear with me right now. I'm just going to share my screen with you guys. Of course, um, my computer is like running slow. Slower than usual. Okay, there we go. All right, so um, professional development for the professional musician. I know all of us are, are, are very busy and, and very we have hectic days. Uh, but I just wanted to share over the next 15 minutes some, some opportunities for us to get better. And I think that's the most important thing as musicians. Uh, here's my contact information if any of you would like to, um, if you have questions or you want to follow up with me afterwards on my website, uh, email, Instagram, it's all there. So I have, um, I've always considered professional development simply one thing, to be quite honest, and it's, it's not improvement, but I've broken it down into four pillars. For me, it's about practice. There's, there's nothing better about getting up early in the morning and practicing. I'm sure, you know, throughout the day, all of us have some very hectic things we have to do. Uh, for me, I have two kids, so I got to get them to school and all that stuff. And so I get up really early and I start practicing. Um, I'm up around 4.30 in the morning every day and um, I hit my Peloton. I'm on there for like 45 minutes. That wakes me up. And I go straight to the piano um, because I, I really feel that's the most productive time for me as a musician is to sit at the piano and to, to grind through uh, music and to discover some really wonderful music. Um, I'm going to go into these a little bit more in detail afterwards. Uh, lessons. When was the last time each of you has taken a lesson, right, and, and allowed yourself to be vulnerable? Just think about that. And, and think about those moments when you are you prepare for your lesson um, and you go in there and sit there with your teacher. Think about the times where you felt very confident about what you've done. And also think about the times where you're afraid <laughs> because, you know, I had a lot of those moments in my life where I said, I don't really think my teacher wants to see me today based on the, uh, the lack of work I've done. Um, and then for me, professional development includes a lot of personal personal learning, um, concerts and master classes, reading articles, going to festivals. And then probably for all of us, we always think about professional development as uh, conferences, workshops, you know, online groups like this. I'm not even going to talk about that because I'm sure all of you have gone to your state festival, your provincial festival, your national festival, you've been to MTNA or you've been to uh, uh, NKCP, all these these great things where you can meet with colleagues and you can attend those things. And, you know, as wonderful as those are, I want to just really focus today on what you can do right now in your own home, because I think all of us are dealing with the pandemic and we, we don't get to go to um, in-person events. So let's start off here with practicing. Here's a quote from uh, Busoni. He said, if possible, allow no day to pass without touching your piano. And this is not touching your piano in terms of I'm teaching and I'm showing my student how to play a scale. No, to me, touching the piano means like getting dirty with this thing, <laughs> you know, working through it and, and taking the opportunity to get better. But here's another thing. I practice when I'm teaching, believe it or not. I practice a lot because when I'm showing my student how to play a scale, I'm like, well, you know what? This is a great opportunity for me to improve. I'm going to play the scale here with dynamics. 
because if I'm not demonstrating that to my students, if I'm not demonstrating that scale and playing it with dynamics, they're not going to get it. So to me, teaching is practicing. If I can put my hands on the piano when my students here or on Zoom or Skype or whatever it is, I'm going to use that time to practice. So these are some of my suggestions for practicing. Learn a new piece. I'm sure there's a piece out there that you've wanted to learn. And you say, well, I'll do this later. And you keep putting it off. And that was the case for me. I, I've been wanting to learn the Chopin B minor sonata for years now. Okay, I'm 43. I've wanted to learn it since I was 21. So 22 years later, <laughs> I decided I'm going to start this piece because we had the pandemic. I was like, this is great because every concert and every trip that I had planned was canceled. Right. So I wasn't preparing for chamber concerts. I wasn't preparing for concertos. It's like, finally, I can actually sit down and learn this giant of a piece. So that I, and I sent that as a note to all my students. I'm like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm learning this piece during the pandemic. And I gave them three other sonatas I was going to learn, which included the Prokofiev seventh piano sonata and Mozart B flat major K 333. These are all pieces I've always wanted to learn. And now I actually had a chance. Uh, relearn an old piece, you know, that's professional development because you take your experiences from previous pieces and life experiences and you apply it back to it and you look at the piece in a new light. Learn a new instrument. I know Heather plays the flute. She's been doing that, you know, and I have some other friends um, who are exploring new instruments. One of my good friends, Paul Schmaltz. He's been working on the guitar and he's been taking guitar lessons for like the last 10 years. Um, I have a violin friend, Jeremy Van Diemen, same thing. He's been learning how to play the piano. And I asked him, I was like, why are you learning to play the piano? He's like, well, I, I've always wanted to accompany my students. And that way it's just something new for me. It's a new challenge. So I said, like, well, that's, that's cool. Um, I know I have a friend in California and some of you may know her. Her name is Deborah Howe. She's like learning the cello. She's very accomplished at the flute. She plays, that's professional development. It's not about just attending these um, workshops and getting teaching ideas. It's actually, to me, again, professional development is acquiring new skills at your instrument. Um, learn what you are teaching your student. I say it to my pedagogy students, whatever I'm teaching, I know how to play it. I can demonstrate it because if I can't demonstrate it, I can't teach it. And just find a challenge for yourself. Go out there and, you know, you might look at a piece and say, well, that's really, really hard. I don't know if I'm going to learn it. Maybe I'll choose the easier piece. No, choose the harder piece. You know, we, we should be very thankful that we're we, in this career that's so fulfilling and that we can make a living doing it. And so, challenge take that next challenge and learn something that is harder something that's going to push you to be better because here's the other thing is going to inspire your students when your students see you taking on something that's demanding they're going to go and say oh you know what my teacher does that all these things my teacher teaches me i'm going to go and do it lessons are great i love lessons like i said think about at the beginning, think about what you learned in your lessons and, and how you felt going into your lesson. Um, for me to play for my teacher, I haven't played for him in a while because of the pandemic. He's in New York City. Um, it's always a learning experience. I go in there and I say, what don't I know? And whatever it is, I want you to I want you to teach me. I want to get every ounce of your knowledge. That to me is professional development. And it's not just with my teacher. I always play for other people. I play for friends. And there's always opinions. There's always ideas. There's always something to share. And, and it's the same thing. People come and play for me, professional musicians. And you're just giving your input and you're just giving some suggestions. We all need mentors. We all need inspiration. So um, use your lessons. And you don't have to go back to when you're 12 years old or 13 years old and doing lessons every single week. You know, a couple times a year. I, I saw, you know, on the Utah State Music Teachers Association website at their conference that they offer private lessons. It's the first time I've seen at a conference that offers private lessons. I thought this is fantastic because here we are at a conference and there's some really wonderful teachers here 
and I can go and play a piece for them. I can go and ask them questions. That to me is, is a really wonderful and exciting opportunity to, to get better. Okay, let's jump onto the next section here. Um, Self-learning, master classes. Um, this is me about a month ago giving a master class on Zoom. And this is the great thing now with, with uh, the pandemic, so many of us are online. There's so many master classes that are online and we don't have to like be playing for, you know, Gary Grafman and Long Long and all these great musicians. There's a lot of wonderful master classes that we can enroll in um, for all instruments and use that opportunity just to play through pieces. You can see in this, this um, uh, session, I remember this girl, Audrey, she, she said, you know, can I play the piece with um, the music? And I said, sure. She said, I don't have it memorized, but I'll play with the music. And I was like, great. I think this is not the Juilliard or the Manhattan School of Music um, prestigious conservatory master class. This is a class just to help whatever it is that a student brings. And that's why I enjoy this so much. So check out the master classes, not only about you playing in the master class, but watching a master class. Um, did you know Medici TV has tons of master classes online that you can watch? So there's Andre Schiff. Murray Pariah, Richard Good, these great, great pianists, Joyce D. Leonardo. I learned so much from watching master classes. I learned so much from going to concerts. Now I know there's no live concerts now. So Medici TV is great again because of all these concerts on replay. So if you want to learn about one of the pieces you're studying, perhaps you're doing a Beethoven sonata. You know, it's Beethoven year. There's tons of replays of Barenboim and Richard Good doing Beethoven. Listen to those concerts with your score, write things down, ask questions, maybe watch the concert with a friend, with a colleague, and then compare notes. I've always enjoyed going to concerts and that's professional development because I'm learning about how music should sound. If I don't know what the possibilities of color and harmony and dynamics are in a concert setting, how can I learn that myself? How can I go and practice those? Because my ears are shut. I need to open my ears. It's just like an artist. The wider your eyes are, and you see all the colors, and you see more possibilities for your own artistic endeavors. So, you're probably like, why is there this picture of a church at night? Traveling abroad and going to festivals is a great opportunity for professional development. Um, there's a lot of festivals, and I'm not saying like go to Aspen and, or do Music Academy of the West. There's a lot of festivals in Europe that are designed for the musician of all levels, all ages, and all experiences. Yes, there's Verbier, which is like the big one out in Europe, but again, it's like really expensive. And you know, one night hotel in um, Switzerland um, is like five, six hundred dollars. Like no one can afford this festival. But this festival that I do in Italy, this is Cremona. Cremona is the city of violins where Stradivarius and Amati honed their craft. It's where Monteverdi went to school, believe it or not. Monteverdi went to school in Cremona. We teach at the Monteverdi Conservatory. And down the street, well, not a street, but 20 miles away from Cremona is the birthplace of Verdi. So this is a very inspirational place. And I bring my students here. I bring my pedagogy students. I've had students, um, well, not, they're not even students. They're adults, they're teachers, and they've come. So here's the website, CremonaAcademy.com. Take a look at it. We hope to run the festival this year. We have dates, we're ready to go. As long as, uh, you know, Corona decides to disappear, we're ready to have a festival. And in the past, we've had a number of teachers come and they've said, can I audit? Can I watch your teachers teach? And we said, absolutely. So we have a lot of professional musicians, teachers that come to observe teachers. They also take lessons. And we say, look, since you're here, we want you to play too. We want you to participate in chamber music. Can you play in the piano duo? Would you like to play in orchestra? Would you like to sing in choir? Do you want to play in a student recital? Can we give teachers the opportunity to come back to why we love music and what we did as kids or as teenagers or in university. So I welcome you all to take a look at Cremona Academy. 
I welcome you all to, to join me this year or next year or in the future. Um, but like I said, there's other festivals in Europe that offer uh, teachers professional development. One of the cool things about self-development is assessment. I've always, in preparation for a concert, tried to play my pieces through for as many people as humanly possible. And pre-pandemic, that was always tricky because you had to schedule it and people had to drive to your home or you had to drive somewhere else. In college, it was easy. I just knock in a practice room and find someone to listen to me. But with the pandemic, it's been great because all I had to do was just send a text or an email and said, could we meet on Zoom? I just you know, want to play my program through. I did that with Heather, actually, um, in preparation for a concert in November. I asked her, you know, could you just listen to me play? And it was great because it helped me to kind of work out some nerves, work out some mistakes, try some new ideas. But more importantly, I needed to hear what I sounded like on Zoom. So I recorded myself. And I listened to it and I was like, okay, that's not what I expected. That's a very different sound. So recording yourself playing for someone else is great professional development. That's why I say practice performances. The more you can practice that performance, we always practice the piece. But if you practice playing for someone, it becomes a lot easier and it'll become a lot easier for your students as well in preparation for their um, recitals. You can do exams, you can do competitions. There's tons of competitions for amateur pianists or uh, teachers of all levels. So I would suggest taking a look at um, those. And there seems like there's a lot more nowadays because so, many, so much of it is online. So all you gotta do is put a recording together and just send it off to you know whatever the competition is. And I've noticed that the entry fees are fairly minimal, like 20, 25, $30. Some are more expensive because they have bigger prizes, but again, it's very accessible. What I've also liked about recording and hearing myself is that I now have video and audio evidence of what I've done. I have to be extremely honest with myself when I hear myself because it's proof. It's telling me that like, well, that scale, you really blew it or the balance was really, really nice there. So, hearing yourself that's professional development like i said you know workshops and all those things are great but hearing your own self and learning about what you do is going to lead you to become a stronger a more powerful more insightful more knowledgeable teacher because you can take those personal experiences of practicing of preparation and transfer it over to your students my students say you know you know derek why are you never nervous to perform I say, because I've played it. I've played it out so many times. I've worked it away. And they say, well, what if I do that? And I say, exactly what you should do. So again, during the pandemic, it was easy for my students. I said, every single week, schedule a day where you get to play for one of your friends or your family members or your grandparents or your aunt on Zoom. And trust me, the first time it'll be kind of like, you know, iffy, but you do it nine, 10, 11 times you're gonna feel very good come the time you actually have to play your recital. Finally, this is your classroom, the stage. There's no greater place to gain professional development and experience than walking on stage. I know it's scary. I know that for a lot of teachers out there, one of the reasons why we teach is because we don't want to perform because the whole idea of being on stage is terrifying. Just take a look at this picture. If you just look above my head, there's two people. When have you played a performance where the concert hall was a 360 degree circle? This terrified me, by the way. I had always wanted to play in this concert hall in Cremona. And when I did, it was just, you know, I prepped my students for it. But then I did it and it was crazy because the entire concert, believe it or not, those two people were talking the entire concert. And the piece that my chamber group is playing here, that's Roberto Cani. He's the concert master of the LA Opera. That's Marguerite Levine. She's a professor of clarinet at Peabody Conservatory. 
we're playing Stravinsky's L'Histoire de Soldat, which is a counting nightmare. So while I'm playing, I'm counting in my head, I'm subdividing, and there's two people talking in Italian the entire time <laughs> in the left side of my ear. That is how I got better that day, is to have that distraction, yet know in my mind all the practice that I had done was going to pay off. There's no better classroom than being on stage. There's no better place than experiencing things because you can't simulate that in your lesson. There's no way you can simulate two people talking in Italian to your students. And again, these are things that just randomly happen in concerts. When was the last time you played and there's people looking at you at all directions? The other thing is when I'm looking on the opposite end of the piano, guess what? There's people staring at me looking at this way, right? So you look up, you look at your music and you see a pair of eyes at you. It's so nerve wracking. It's so different. So I challenge you, I encourage you all, it's about improvement, it's about development. When's the next time you can get on stage? It doesn't have to be L'Histoire de Soldat. It can be a Bach invention. It can be one of the pieces that your student's learning. Go and do that. You know, the Zoom recitals that we're doing, that's another great place to do that. You prepare, you study, you record yourself. The pandemic's been great. It's been terrible, but it's been great for us to get better. And with the technology, I would just encourage you to take your studio that I see you all in, turn that into your stage and prepare something and you'll really appreciate the development, the professional development you're going to get from practicing, from taking lessons, participating in master classes, and perhaps traveling abroad and studying at a music festival. So thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the rest of uh, the, the sessions today and everyone else who's going to be speaking. Are there any questions? No, a lot of head shaking, so that's good. <laughs> Thank you so much, Derek. That was fabulous. I, I would love to attend your, your uh, festival <laughs> in, in Italy. I've never been to Europe before, so that sounds fabulous. Thank yeah, come and we'll eat a lot of, lot of gelato, <laughs> oh. drink really good wine, and eat lots of really good pasta and pizza. So <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you for having me. So our next presentation is uh, by Paul Myatt, and he is from Sydney, Australia. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar with the time zone on where that's at, it's 4 a.m. his time right now. And so he is not able to meet in person, but he sent his presentation in a recording. So I'm going to pull that up and share that with you. His present, let me just give you a little bit of background on him before we begin. He is the um, co-founder of Forte School of Music in, um, they, they're located in four different uh, countries. And he, their main, folk, their main um, headquarters is in, in Australia. He is also the co-founder of the Piano Teacher Success Q&A, which is a popular uh, Australian TV show. And so that's, if you know anything about that, he and Gillian are amazing. So I'm gonna share his presentation on improvisation. Hi everyone, and thank you, Heather. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to share my thoughts about improvisation with your teacher's pedagogy group. I've been teaching piano for over 30 years and I still love teaching. I have 60 students in group lessons over three afternoons each week. I teach kids from beginners through to every grade of the Trinity College exam syllabus up to grade eight, which is roughly equivalent to level 10 RCM. My students experience every type of music from Baroque to rock and everything in between. Improvisation plays an important part of their learning experience. Some of my students want to study composition at university. Another recently won a composition award and a further two are about to have their songs recorded by an indie record label. You know, back in the olden days, everyone learned to improvise. It was an essential part of learning music 
and in particular playing keyboard instruments. The traditional approach to instrumental and piano tuition that many of us experienced as a child started in the 19th century with advances in paper manufacturing technology. Prior to the 1800s, music was taught by ear, passing on tunes, melodies and harmonies through listening, movement and dance. Paper before the 19th century was a rare and expensive commodity and not readily available to the general public. The advent of inexpensive paper allowed the easy distribution of printed music. With that came a necessity to read the music. For many people, piano lessons have always been about reading the music and playing by reading. When Heather invited me to speak about improvisation, she told me her experience of learning improvisation, which is similar to many teachers' experience, because most students are never given the opportunity to explore the area of music making. When I was a kid, I played the breakfast table along with the radio, hoping that my parents would buy me a piano. It was in the 70s and the electronic organ had risen to become the instrument du jour. So my parents bought me a second-hand organ, which came with a massive box of music and accompanying cassette tapes. I taught myself how to play from these cassettes and decoded the accompanying sheet music. After a couple of months, mum and dad realised that I was doing okay and found me a teacher. Learning electronic organ was not just about reading the music. I played with drum beats and different sounds and learned to improvise and read chord charts as well. So while I was lucky to experience the opportunity to improvise learning organ, I do know what it's like to learn in a traditional approach. When I was nine, I started learning the French horn. I have a very distinct memory of turning up to my third French horn lesson and telling my teacher that I had decided that the melody that I was playing, which I believe was by Bach, would sound so much better by adding a jazzy swing rhythm. Well, I was quickly informed that one must never alter what was written by the composer and to only play what is written on the music. That was the end of my French horn improvisations. Even though the French horn was my principal instrument when I studied at university, I never improvised on the French horn. I'm sharing this story because it illustrates the blocks that we as adults put in our heads from things that teachers tell us when we were children. So turning back to improvisation, I feel that I'm a much better musician because of my improvisation skills. And I also see that my own students and their parents love seeing their kids make things up. There are many ways to learn how to improvise. The first thing we need to deal with in teaching improvisation is a fear of failure. Many people are scared because they may make a mistake. And that's only natural when we spend most of our time as teachers correcting our students to play exactly what's written. And now we're saying, play something different. Teaching improvisation requires preparation and a strong framework. That means your students need lots of musical experiences before they start improvising by themselves. They're going to need to explore different patterns, rhythmically, melodically, and harmonically. I love Forrest Kinney's work in pattern play and chord play, and also Bradley Sowash's books called That's Jazz and Creative Chords. But today I'm going to share another strategy, which is to take something that a student has learned and then give them the opportunity to use the elements from the music as the basis to improvise, build a new piece or extend that piece. Before we start, I'd like to give you some ideas of what you can do with beginner students to help them build a rich vocabulary of musical experiences before they move into their own improvisations. Here's eight-year-old Julia starting with a rhythmic exercise, which is then taken to chimes and then to piano. 
Firstly, I'm just asking her to copy me. Then I give her the opportunity to do question and answer activities. There are three things that I want you to look out for. Mostly, we stay in time using three beat patterns. When we get out of time, I always come back to a three quarter note pattern. Initially, only use three notes. So with the melodic exercises, we're using C, D and E. And thirdly, I acknowledge the home note or tonic, highlighting that the piece sounds finished. Tap back to me, Julia. Good work. Now I'm going to give you a question. You give me an answer. All right, listen. Good work. All right, shall we put one beater away? And play back to me. carefully. Nice. I was just waiting for an ending one. What does it what does it sound like when it sounds like an ending one? What does it finish on? So what note does it finish on? Do. Do or C. Exactly. Alright. So different now ones? we've got to start different ones. Yeah. So you're going first. If you've done these sorts of activities with your students, you'll find that they will feel very comfortable exploring improvisation. 
The piece I'm going to share with you has no name other than Contemporary 6415 and uses the chords A minor, F, C and G. I gave this piece to my mid to late intermediate students as a sight reading activity. It uses the four chord pattern that the kids hear in many songs of today. One boy even said this was the best song he'd learned all year. your students learn the piece, whether they use uh, rote learning, by ear, by sight, whatever, the important section is the first eight bars in the left hand, which your student will use as the baseline for their own right hand exploration. Start by giving your students some options. Start with three notes. You could change one of the phrases. Use notes from the chords. Give your student a rhythm to compose to. Here's 11 year old Mel with an eight bar version of her improvisation that she's playing with the backing track. Stephanie has turned this into a whole piece that she has made up. I hope this short session was helpful and a great starting point for improvisation. Remember, it, if it doesn't work out the first time with your students, don't worry. Try it again in the next lesson. The more you try, the more your students will succeed with improvisation. Thank you so much, Paul. That was so helpful. I. Um have the uh, sheet music and the backing track, the, the link that he shared at the end of that, I'm going to put that in our chat notes, but uh, it's pianoteachingsuccess.com backslash Heather Smith. If you want to try this out with some of your students, that's where you can receive it. So we're gonna go ahead and go to Dr. Adam Haas, who is from Colorado Springs Conservatory in Colorado Springs, Colorado. He is the head of the piano department at the school, and we're, I'm really looking forward to hearing the presentations on two different uh, intermediate level topics. So thank you, Adam. Yeah, thank you, Heather, and it's good to see everyone. Um, thank you, Heather, for um, this time to share a couple pieces with you. Um, I'm going to start with um, Handel's Allegro in G minor, and if you all have your 
RCM level seven repertoire book. This is on page six. Um, if you don't have it, Heather, do you have that to pull up as well? Okay, great. Thank you, Heather. So I'll just start off um, by playing through this. Um, this comes from Handel's, uh, the third movement of Handel's G minor suite. So this is the Allegro in G minor. to share um, some of my thoughts um, around this piece and maybe more specifically about how I approach um, Baroque teaching with my students and how I can get them into this music. I've, I have a lot of students who struggle with Baroque music. They know it's really old and to them that means it's just not cool. Um, I also have a lot of students that struggle with the fact that um, Baroque music tends to just be a lot of notes on the page and there's not not a lot of other information to help the student like articulations and dynamics. So it can be a tricky style to um, help students uh, work through and understand and, and really enjoy. But I feel like once they kind of understand the style and the beauty of this music, um, sometimes that tends to stick with them more than other pieces. And I've had a lot of students that end up loving Baroque more than anything else because there's so much expressiveness and there's a lot of freedom for the for the uh, performer to kind of put their own um, interpretation on the music. So for this piece um, specifically, um, when, I, when I first look at it, it almost starts kind of like a two-part invention and it only lasts that way for about a couple measures and then it kind of goes into just you know basically 16th notes in the right hand and accompanimental notes in the left hand but I think it's important that right in those first couple measures that the student sees that there's some imitation going on here and that's an important part of Baroque music where the right hand starts the melody the left hand imitates it the next measure so right off the bat it's a good opportunity to to help the student um, really listen for the balance between hands. Um, it's important that there's equality between both hands um, throughout the whole piece and that you find these moments where um, the right hand might have the melody and then maybe the left hand takes over after that. So I, I think I mentioned that, that one thing that's kind of unique about Baroque music is that composers from this style and from this period rarely used articulations or dynamic markings and that's kind of the case in this piece there's really nothing to go off of and so some students are scared by that they like to have um, all the information on the page and just do exactly what's what's written on the page and other students um, they, they like that freedom and so um, when, when I approach this with both kinds of students, I like to kind of lay some, some groundwork as far as what kinds of articulations work well for fast pieces, what kinds work better for slower, more lyrical pieces, um, and then we can also talk through dynamics. And then this also kind of naturally leads to a discussion on what kinds of instruments were used in the Baroque period, and so we can start talking about the harpsichord and how that's different than our modern instrument. And, and what would a harpsichordist do to make this kind of piece expressive? And that's really where we get down to the use of articulations, where a harpsichordist was really focused on the length of notes and how some notes may be separated from others to show the start of a new line or maybe how they would lift at the end of a line. 
So all these things are really important when, when introducing Baroque music to a student. So I just kind of wanted to go over some specific articulation things that, that I think could work on this piece. Um, one thing I might start off doing with the student is to say, let's just try playing through the piece and let's play all the eighth notes staccato. And so, you know, a student who likes to have things written on the page, you might want to actually write in some of the staccato notes on the eighth notes. Um, so then they could play through it that way. And then that completely changes the character of the piece. And then you might say, well, let's try on all the eighth note measures, let's slur the first two and play the, um, you know, the second two short. So it could be something like this. Um, like if you look at measure three in the left hand, so you can just kind of get really creative with your student and before you know it, they're starting to come up with their own articulations. Um, they might want to do some measures all staccato and they might want to then shift into more of a you know, two note slur and some other measures. So this really opens up some creativity. It allows them to um, come up with their own ideas and put their own interpretation in the music. As far as dynamics go, you know, when you're talking about a harpsichord, it's important to note that you know, they didn't have a lot of dynamic control. If you had a two manual harpsichord, you could have one manual loud and the other manual soft, but other than that, there was not a lot of um, kind of gray area in between where you had these you know, varying levels of dynamics. But you know, for me personally, I like to encourage my students to still use dynamics. We're playing on a modern instrument, and I, you know, if Bach had this instrument, I definitely think he would have included a lot of dynamics, crescendos, decrescendos, some spots loud, some spots soft. So just like we do with articulations, we can get creative with this. And student, I've had a lot of students that love this. You know, I can say, give them a homework assignment that next week I want you to come back and I want you to write in some dynamics. It doesn't have to be anything crazy, but maybe, you know, you start loud and then this section you get soft, crescendo here. Um, I can help them find some ideas, like if a line goes up, you can crescendo, things like that. Um, if there's, you know, a repeating section, maybe you do it soft, kind of like an echo, things like that. So just another opportunity to work in some creativity and let the student make some decisions um, about how they want to play this piece. Um, some other Baroque things that, that I think are really important to point out. Um, one is this idea of like a hidden SATB texture. And, and I know this is a two-part piece, but if you look at kind of ranges, you can see several spots in here where it might jump down an octave, and you could kind of see that as going from like a tenor to a bass. So um, a good example would be in measures 13 and 14, if you look at the left hand, um, it starts on the B flat. You have the B, E flat, D in the one octave, and then it jumps up the octave. And, you know, some students might just play all of that connected. But I think this is an opportunity to point out that you could feasibly see this as a bass part down low, jumping to a tenor part. And, and the way to show that is to separate them and, and use these... Um, articulations that we've been talking about this whole time. Um, another example um, is measures 33 and 34. The right hand starts high. So you have this G, A flat, G, and then it drops down like a soprano jumping down to um, an alto part. So it's important that the student hears these differences and they can see these jumps in range and then talk about how you want to um, bring that out. Do you want to play the soprano part loud, play the bottom part softer, kind of like an echo, do different articulations? Um, all these things really bring this kind of music to life. Um, another thing that, that, that I think um, may not be immediate, ev immediately evident to students in this kind of music is that there are these kind of hidden um, or maybe outlining melodic notes that, that we can pull out of the texture. So I think um, a good example, kind of that same spot I was just at, measures 33 through 37, um, we have that soprano part, it goes down to alto. So 
has sort of a little outlining melody um, that, that doesn't include a lot of the 16th notes that are around them. So it's important that the student hears these notes, they know where they are, and you might need, even need to go in and kind of highlight them, put little tenuto markings on them. Um, but this kind of, these kind of notes are all over the place, and they're little hidden melodies that, that can help a student shape some of this so that it doesn't just look like a continuous line of 16th notes that never ends. Um, implied harmonies can really help a student uh, make decisions about articulations. Um, a really good example is measures one through eight. Um, and I like to have students do a little bit of a harmonic analysis. It's kind of tricky with these two-part pieces because you have to imagine some notes that aren't really there. Um, but essentially we have one, five, one, five, one, and it does that for a while in that kind of pattern where the five happens on beat three, but then you get to measure seven and you have a one chord on beat one, and it jumps to four on beat two. So it short, sort of shifts the harmonic emphasis a little bit. And um, so that might be a good opportunity to play a staccato on the downbeat and then slur beats two and three in the left hand, just to help emphasize that harmony right there. Um, and then kind of one of the last things that I, I like to talk about is um, the use of lifting and showing where phrases end and how you start a new phrase and how that can have direction um, you know, throughout the, the uh, phrases. Um, a good example is measures uh, 59 to 60. Um, right at the downbeat of measure 60, the phrase ends. And then it goes right into 16th notes. And, and in this score, you know, there's no end of a, like a slur ending or anything like that. So it's kind of hard to tell, does this just continue? Do you connect everything? Um, so it's important, you know, you can draw a slur in and end it on that G on the downbeat of 60 and then put a little lift and then draw another slur if you want. But it's important that the student knows that even though there's no slurs or phrase endings or anything, that there needs to be a lift there so that they can then start the next line and have direction through the next melody. Um, so that's that's pretty much it on this piece. Um, I, th I think Baroque music opens so many possibilities for creativity and um, kind of coming up with your own ideas for how the music should sound. Um, you know, there's really just notes on the page, and but but the student needs to be able to add a lot more, and it's and it's you know kind of up to us to give them the background of the style and the period and what instruments these composers and performers were playing on. Um, so, that, so that they have all this information to help them make the decisions for the piece. So I'm now going to move on to the second piece. This is a list C for a level seven. Um, it's the Solitary Traveler. And if you have your book, it's page 44. And, but I think Heather will also uh, pull up the score. Uh, this is one of Edvard Grieg's lyric pieces, and if you aren't familiar with his lyric pieces, um, they're really wonderful, um, charming works um, that are great teaching pieces as well, especially for introducing um, late Romantic style. Uh, there are, I think, 66 lyric pieces, and they're organized into uh, 10 books. Uh, the Solitary Traveler is number two of Opus 43, and Opus 43 is, I think, the third book. And there's, I think, five other pieces in that one. So I'd encourage you to check out some of these pieces. Um, they're, they're wonderful. And um, so I'm going to play Solitary Traveler, and then we'll, I'll just talk through some, some things about this piece.
simple piece. A um, lot of really interesting details that, that uh, have to be worked through to understand this piece. Um, with a lot of the lyric pieces, they have very descriptive titles. So that's kind of where I would start with this piece. Um, I would probably have the student either listen to a recording or maybe play it for them and then just start talking through, you know, what does, what do they think when they see the title Solitary Traveler and they hear this piece? Um, you know, what does that mean to them? How do they, you know, do they have a picture in their mind of a traveler and then how, how does the music portray, um, you know, what this traveler is going through or do they have ideas of, of what kind of journey this person's going through? And then we need to figure out how we're going to express that in the music. Um, so with a lot of pieces, I like to start off with just kind of talking through form and maybe some harmonic analysis. But specifically on, on the form of this one, it's very straightforward. It's kind of just like a big A-B form where the B section is repeated. Um, and so maybe, you know, talking through the form, you, you realize it's very sectional where you have very obvious phrases. The phrases have obvious lifts. Um, and ends of those phrases. So then how does that relate to this idea of a traveler going through a journey and maybe each section is a different part of their journey and, and how do we bring that out? The, you know, the journey needs to change, there needs to be some progression through that. So for these kinds of pieces, you know, especially in late romantic, I think it's important to have pictures in your mind and an idea of, of what kind of, um, what kind of, uh, picture you're trying to portray as you play. Um, so this piece is obviously very contrasting to the uh, handle that I just played. One of the important things that, the, that a student needs to be able to grasp with this is the, the super legato touch. So I like to have students work on um, letting notes almost sustain over from one note to the next to create this, this super velvety smooth legato touch. Um, where notes kind of bleed in from you know from one note to the next and so we can do that on scales i can have them play scales where um, they just let notes hang over just a little bit and you know i've, I've had some students who have never really thought about connecting notes this way you know they just think of legato as they just need to hold one note and release it as soon as they play the next note. Well, on piano, because it's kind of a percussive sound where hammers are striking strings, um, each note you know, has its own articulation and it can be a kind of a strong articulation. So if you're releasing a note right away, as soon as you play ne the next one, um, that's not really as smooth as it could possibly be. So I like to work on that with a piece like this where we just let notes really almost hang over into the next note. Um, some other things that I think are, are really interesting in this piece. One is the use of this accent on beat six. And, you know, I think it's important that the student knows this is not, you know, a, a Prokofiev accent where it's, it's very, you know, aggressive and then a punched sound, but it's more of a, you know, dropping weight right onto beat six. Um, so that there's that really clear tone that comes right on that, on that beat. Um, and this kind of happens throughout this piece. Um, a fra the phrase structure in measures one through eight, it, it really kind of breaks down into a one, uh, sorry, measures one through four, it's like a one plus one plus two. So kind of one, like your typical phrase structure. And I think it helps, especially on the, the two measure part at the end of this phrase that the student sees that as one long line, even though um, if you look at the slurs, it's kind of broken up. It looks kind of like two phrases, but I think it makes more sense to think of that as one long line. So if you look at measures four, we can think of two short phrases and then one longer phrase. And then this happens again, uh, measures five through eight as well. Uh, measure uh, three has some tricky double six, and um, it's important that uh, the student connects the top line, and they know that the bottom part of those six um, needs to be light and can be a little separated, but it's important that the top part is really smooth and connected because that's what our ear hears. 
So, kind of bringing out that top part where the melody is, keeping the bottom note really light. One way to practice that is to play the bottom note almost silent, kind of like ghost playing, but the top part is forte. So that'll help them kind of shift that weight to that top note. Um, throughout this piece, the left hand frequently doubles the melody. So you could kind of go through and maybe find some spots where you bring out the left hand a little bit more than the right hand. Um, especially if a melody gets repeated. That just changes it up a little bit and now you hear it more down in kind of the tenor part even though it's still happening up in the soprano. Um, the tempo is kind of an interesting thing uh, to discuss with this piece. It's, it has this alleg allegretto marking which to me gives, needs to um, really implies that the piece needs to have some forward motion and some kind of a lightness to it the 6-8 needs to have a little bit of a lilt, so, so it's important that the student doesn't think this so much in 6, but it still has that 2 feel, um, even though the tempo marking marks it as an 8th note. So it still needs to have that forward motion. Um, the pedaling, there are a couple spots. If you look at measure 16, there's this long pedal that's carried over from... Um, from beat 5 of measure 15. So I think that's a really cool moment in this piece where we get some, some, some clashing of harmonies. Um, and you know, this is part of this style where you know composers wanted some of this, a lot of dissonance. And there's not a lot of it in this piece, but that's one moment right there. And we don't want the student to shy away from it. Um, and that happens a couple times in this piece. Is, in this piece. Um, a couple other moments is with pedaling is the ends of phrases. You know, do we want to have a clear lift or do we want the pedal to kind of hold notes over? So you can have this discussion with students. If you look at measure four, the pedal carries over across the rest. And then when you play the pickup into five, that's when you release the pedal. Well, if you do that, then you know, your phrases are basically overlapping a little bit. So you can talk about how you want to lift and do you want to breathe right there? Do you want to lift the pedal a little bit um, before? And that can kind of help with this, uh, this sectional idea of this piece where, uh, you know, this traveler's going on a journey and maybe you want a little more separation between those phrases. Um, the use of rubato, that we can do some of that in this piece, especially on the B section. I kind of feel like the B section moves a little bit more um, B section starts, uh, pick up to measure nine, so you can move the tempo a little bit more here. And then there's a stretto at the end of that first page, so we can really push it and then it pulls back right after. So, so all of these things really um, highlight this late romantic style. And, you know, with that, you know, once a student understands all these expressive markings, I like to have students just try exaggerating them because I feel like it's oftentimes easier to um, to pull them back a little bit than to constantly try to get them to do more. So I might say, I want you to play all your pianos pianissimo and your fortes fortissimo. And if it says stretto, I want you to really push the tempo. And then on a ritardando, we're really going to pull it back just so that they can start to really work with these extreme ranges of expressiveness. Um, I think that's it on this piece. Again, I would encourage you, if, if you haven't checked out any of the other um, lyric pieces, they're incredible. I've maybe only listened to about half of them, but um, they're, they're wonderful pieces, wonderful teaching pieces, um, especially for this uh, late romantic style. So thank you very much, and thank you, Heather. Thank you so much, Adam. That was so so insightful. I am definitely going to take those things that you've shared and share those with my students. Thank you. Thank you to you, Adam and uh, Derek and Paul for your wonderful presentations today. I'm so grateful for all of the time that you took. I know it, it took a lot of time to, pre to prepare and it was obvious you, uh, you all were very prepared. So thank you. Our next, our next meeting will be on February 4th. And um, I look forward to seeing everyone then. Thank you again for coming.